Matt Burt became a motorcycle journalist back in 1996 when he joined Motorcycle News. He stayed with MCN right through till 2014. 2015, he became part of Dawner's commentary team. Now we are workmates and he's one of the main men commentating at MotoGP. He's been a respected part of the motorcycle press for almost 25 years. He's seen a lot of motorcycle racing, which is why I asked Matt, what's the best race you've ever seen? Hello, everybody. Well, first of all, I hope you're all still smiling and staying strong uh, during these difficult times of living at the moment. Now, I've been contacted by my good buddy, my uh, partner or one of my partners in crime in the official MotoGP World Feed commentary team and my coldy drinking companion, Simon Crayfar, to talk about my best ever MotoGP race. Now, I've been super, super lucky to have been involved in MotoGP since 1996. Wow, crikey, nearly 25 years ago now. Where has the time gone? So that fortunately gives me a back catalogue of over a thousand races to pick from across all three classes. But it won't perhaps come as any surprise to most of you. Hey, I'm sure if you were asked this very same question to pick your own uh, great seven motor GP race, this one would be at the top, or if not, very, very close to the top, figuring promptly. Anyway, because my pick for my greatest motor GP race ever is, drum roll, uh, 18th of April 2004, the Fakisa Raceway in Velkham, South Africa, and that unforgettable history-making day when Valentino Rossi won on his factory Yamaha debut. Now, not really a tough one to pick from, but I'll explain you the reasons why, because uh, it's such a, a special moment for me in my career, and one that I will never forget, not just in my time in the paddock, but I think for the rest of my life, that race will, will, will stick with me, not just because of the, the drama, the attention, the emotion, but because of its historical significance, because it really did at that stage in MotoGP trigger quite a, a seismic shift in the power balance away from Honda and back towards Yamaha. Now, just to, before we talk about that particular race, April the 18th, 2004, just to give you some kind of perspective, I just want to talk briefly about 2003 and, and what came before the pre-Rossi era. Now, 2003... Let's not forget, this is Yamaha, a factory with a super proud history, winners throughout their illustrious uh, history as well. Now, they had not won the Premier Class World title since the great Wayne Rainey in 1992. But 2003, just before Rossi arrived, I think it's fair to say without any kind of exaggeration, was pretty much an unmitigated disaster. Now, they'd had one, just one podium finish in the whole of 03, I mean, you think about that happening nowadays, a factory of Yamaha's prominence scoring no victories and just one podium, unheard of. It was, it was a complete disaster. Many people wonder what Rossi was taking on, what kind of a challenge he set himself up for. And it wasn't the fact that Yamaha weren't blessed with really, really high calibre riders in 2003. When you look back, they had Carlos Checa, they had... Alex Barros, so I think my fading memory says not, he did take that one podium in 2003 at the French Grand Prix in Le Mans. They had Norik Abe, they had Marco Melandri, Olivier Jacques and Shinya Nakano were also on Yamahas in 2003. Guys that throughout their careers went on to either or had won races at Grand Prix level, they won Grand Prix titles, world titles, or they went to World Superbikes and won titles in World Superbikes as well. So it was a high-caliber roster that Yamaha were blessed with in 2003. And one other person I want to just give a special mention to, I think he was, I don't think his contribution to 2004 and Rossi's successful career at Yamaha, which of course is still ongoing right now as we speak, I don't think it's undervalued, but I think sometimes his contribution and the magnitude of the role he plays sometimes goes unnoticed and that is Maceo Furosawa who was brought in uh, to run Yamaha prior uh, to Rossi's arrival in 2004 and he basically instigated from the top to the bottom radical sweeping changes a, a huge overhaul of Yamaha's race department back in Iwata their philosophy changed the way they did things from the design process to the thought process everything manufacturing process 
the whole thing changed because Furusawa knew if they had a rider of Valentino Rossi's ilk and his talent, and if he didn't win, well, the blame would not be on Rossi. He dominated on the Honda for so many years. All the blame would fall firmly on the shoulders of Yamaha. And basically, they just got fed up with being the whipping boys. Furusawa couldn't stand to see Yamaha struggling so much. Like I said, just that one podium in 2003. And those two, it was kind of great to see how their relationship blossomed over the years. It became almost like a father and son relationship between Furusawa and with Rossi. And, and their job was not made easy. We should not forget that at the end of 2003, it was a fairly acrimonious split between Rossi and HRC, and they banned him from testing the Yamaha at the end of 03. Valentino didn't throw his leg over a wise dar and one until the Sepang test, the start of 2004. So the preparation time that both Furusawa and the Yamaha engineers wanted for Rossi, and what Rossi wanted himself to get used to the Yamaha, it, it wasn't as long as what they anticipated, although it didn't really seem to affect them too much, did it? As we know, that fateful, unforgettable, memorable day, the 18th of April 2004. I always used to love uh, going to South Africa, long flight from London to Johannesburg, and then a, a long three-hour drive from Joburg to Velkom through uh, open country in South Africa. But I loved the venue. It was a great, great circuit. The people there in the Free State were so welcoming, so accommodating. And I've got to say, it was quite a good social scene down there. Not many hotels, so you had to rent out private houses. Me and five or six uh, UK colleagues who shall remain nameless, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. We, uh, I think it's fair to say, did partake in somewhat of a liquid diet at times. This was pre the internet boom. Uh, so uh, yeah, the entertainment side, the, uh, the post-race uh, extracurricular activities um, used to involve quite a lot of alcohol. So happy days, remember we used to go uh, to South Africa. Now talking about the race weekend itself, of course, everybody was so full of anticipation, buzzing with the hype of could Rossi, having left Honda just a few months before, turn up and produce the unthinkable and win on his factory Yamaha debut. Yes, his departure from Honda had weakened them, but they still had the likes of Alex Barros had moved into HRC. Nicky Hayden was carving out a reputation for himself in Repsol as well. And of course, they still had Max Biaggi and Sete Gibinel on board as well. Now, if Rossi had produced brilliance on Saturday to take pole position, and then it was, of course, the 28-lap race, which for, for so many is the best race they've ever seen. Now, I can picture almost every single lap vividly in my head right now. I mean, 28 laps of just absolute no holes barred racing from the pair of them. We know that the Rossi Biaggi rivalry was one of the most ferocious and intense we've ever seen in the history of the MotoGP World Championship. And there was so much at stake. You know, Rossi wanted to win on his factory Yamaha debut. Biaggi could never be a great success when he was at Yamaha, couldn't win the world title with them. Their relationship was so, so personal. There was more than just the win at stake here. This was pride at stake. There was so much more than just 25 points. And it was just hammer and tongs at each other's throats right from the get-go in that 28-lap race around that Velcom circuit. I think in the whole race, one lap over the line, there was only one time, one lap, where they were split by more than just half a second. So for 27 laps over the line, they were covered by less than 0 0.5, which is just amazing when you think about it. And what was at stake? And uh, for me, you know, it, it, it went down to the last lap. It was so, so hard to call. They'd exchanged paint. There were so many uh, daring overtakes. It, it really was a, a race for the ages. I remember the last six or seven laps, we were all just looking up at the TV screens in the press room, our jaws on the floor thinking, can he do it? Can he do it? Our hearts were trying to jump out of our chests, waiting for the checkered flag to come out. You can imagine what it was like for, for Valentino himself. And then, of course, he did take the checkered flag first. One of the most famous victories, not just of his career in Yamaha's history, but in many respects in the history of the MotoGP World Championship. But who could forget those famous images post-race where basically overcome by emotion you know Valentino had had to dig deep and call on every ounce of his talent that day to win that Grand Prix 
and who, who can forget him parking up that blue Yamaha emblazoned with that famous 46 on that tyre wall and, and just effectively bursting into tears, becoming overcome with emotion as the magnitude of what he achieved really sunk in. Now, back in those days, I was working for uh, Motorcycle News. And of course, at that time, you were desperate to try and produce a, a balanced argument or a balanced story of, of what happened. So on one side, you had just unbridled joy, jubilation, delirium at Yamaha with the Rossi camp. But the flip side of that coin, of course, was Honda, who were in abject dejection and frustration. They could not believe their eyes. They had been beaten by their man. You know, and this was Valentino Rossi proving to the world, not just to himself, but proving to the whole world that it was more about the man than the machine in MotoGP. He'd always felt that Honda had adopted this kind of arrogant attitude, as we said, that it didn't matter who was on board their motorcycles, they would win. But there was Valentino Rossi becoming the first rider in history to win back-to-back -back MotoGP races for different manufacturers. And one thing that really sticks in my mind was post-race, because it's a flyaway race, there's no race transporters, no luxury hospitalities. It's all just basically run out of porter cabins, or it was back in those days. And I remember stumbling across uh, a crestfallen figure. I'll never forget it. Koji Nakajima, who was then the boss of uh, the Repsol Honda team at HRC. He was quite a, a dapper gentleman. He uh, always had a very well manicured, immaculate beard, unlike me, rocking the uh, lockdown look at the moment. Never really a hair out of place. And he always used to wear the, uh, the Top Gun Maverick aviator uh, sunglasses. And there he was smoking a cigarette. And when we approached him and said, you know, is it possible to get some reaction to what you've just seen in the last hour? And you could tell there and then that this was a man who was resigned to his fate. He almost knew that in that, it was 28 laps, he lost his job. He was consigned to losing his job at the end of the season. And that's exactly what happened. So, uh, yeah, unbelievable memories of that day. It kick-started uh, Valentino Rossi and, and Yamaha's legend, uh, Yamaha, a, vel a very happy uh, welcome to his Yamaha career and welcome for Valentino, but a very unwelcome reality check uh, for Honda. Uh, that's it. That's my greatest ever race, the 2004 South African Grand Prix in Welcome. Uh, before I go, just want to say stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully uh, we'll see you at a racetrack very, very soon. Bye for now. Take care.